Hey everybody. Hi, good evening. Friends, we're going to go ahead and get started now. So uh, let me give you a quick orientation before I introduce a special guest as to what's going to happen this evening. Uh, so we are going to hear from a special VIP guest in a second, and then we're going to invite a couple more VIPs to come up to the stage to talk about the topic of this evening, which is about how we support the social impact space in our country. Okay, and we, we're going to watch it. And after we have this conversation with these folks, we're going to see a really uh, a new documentary called Uncharitable. Uh, and so uh, we are excited about showing this to you. It just came out. You'll hear about that in the process of developing the film in a second. But what I want to do, uh, since this film, this film is about uh, investing in the social impact sector. This film is about investing in nonprofit leadership. And it's also a film about the fact that we haven't invested in nonprofit leadership. And that there's a lot of people out here in our region, in our country, and, and in this room that are dedicated to making the lives of other people better but they don't have the resources to get that done. And so I'm super happy to introduce a special person who is uh, an important leader in our state and in our country in philanthropy. Uh, Miguel Santana is the new president and CEO of the California Community Foundation. I think it's his third day on the job, <laughs> fourth day on the job. Um, but for folks that know, uh, this is not Miguel's first rodeo. He was also the president and CEO of the Weingar Foundation. He was also a, a leader in, in city government in our region, making sure that we were taking care of the folks that are unhoused and taking care of working families. So this man knows a lot about what it takes to change society and to make it better. And so Miguel uh, only has five, five, ten minutes with us today because he actually has the mayor's staff waiting for him at his office, so he has to run back. Uh, and so, but he wanted to come and say hi to us and introduce this movie. So Miguel, thank you for coming. Thank you. Let's give Rudy a round of applause. So, how many of you are in the nonprofit sector now? Okay. So I figured. Because unless you're a policy nerd like me, or you really care about this work, you wouldn't be here tonight. And I actually, um, he's not kidding that I, the mayor's office is in my office right now with working on a few items related to housing and homelessness. And for one of them, I said, I have to run, I have to do this important thing. And, and she said, I know exactly where you're going, and I try to get in, but there was a waiting list. So I know this is a hot ticket. Nobody understands how relevant this is and everyone in this room. You each have to figure out how you're going to fulfill a mission while at the same time pay your employees what they deserve. Each one of you confront every day that trade-off. And there isn't one nonprofit organization that I know that, that would pay their employees more if they could. And so the, the issue of the fact that the nonprofit sector is taken advantage of is, a, is an issue that you understand every single day. This is not an academic thing. This is, gives you a stomach ache, sleepless nights, and as much as you try to make the case to philanthropy, to government, to funders that we can't do it on a 5% administration. It's impossible. But then when they insist on it, you don't have a choice. It's not uncommon that I receive a call from a nonprofit leader asking for help. I, in fact, I received one this weekend. I was out shopping. Um, for my first day of school on Monday, <laughs> and, um, and a nonprofit leader called me, and he said, I, re on a, I really, I feel so bad bothering you on a Sunday, but I'm running out of cash in the next 30 days. And it's not because I don't know how to manage my funds. This is an organization that is on the large side among all of the nonprofit organizations is because my government partner owes me three million dollars for work that we did two years ago. And so he, he knew 
that um, I know the city and the county, uh, and he asked me, could you place some calls on my behalf? Efrain knows who I'm talking about. And so I did, I bothered people on a Sunday to insist that the, the, the statement, oh, we're almost there, after you hear it for six months, has real consequences to real people. And, and not just to the folks that are being served, and this particular nonprofit serves the unhoused, okay? Folks who are in desperate need and whose support is literally life-changing. But to the very employees that, that rely on this work, but do it not for the money because they believe in the mission. So unfortunately, he's not the first nonprofit leader to call me that way. And so one of the things that philanthropy needs to do more of, something that I'm very proud we did at the Weingart Foundation and uh, will expand at the California Community Foundation, is to provide unrestricted funding. At Weingart, 90% of all the dollars out are unrestricted. And it's very intentional not to, to minimize reporting, to minimize you know, the application process, because you know, the metric that most matters is the fact that you exist. And so that's what trust-based philanthropy is, is when you literally say, we trust you to do your work and we believe in what you're doing, go do it. We should be the least of your problems, not the greatest problem. And so on one hand, Weingart's on that extreme, and there are many others, the majority who are on the other. So you have my commitment as the head of this foundation, but also as someone who engages with philanthropy in, in many different ways. I was just with the heads of the Irvine Foundation and, and many other foundations this week, on, on Monday and Tuesday, and we had this very specific conversation around how do we, frankly, get out of the way and not become the burden that takes away the energy and the focus to what most matters, and that's the people we serve. So I want to personally thank you for your commitment to the work that each one of you do, and to say that um, I'm here as a partner to ensure that we get this done right. Thank you very much. Can we get another round of applause from you again? meeting. Uh, friends, uh, what I want to do now um, is spend just uh, 15 minutes before the movie starts with uh, a couple of other special guests, and I want to invite them up uh, right now to have a conversation. And I want to ask, I'm curious about their perspective on how we're investing in the nonprofit sector. The first person that's coming up here is Efrain Escobedo. Efrain is our co-host tonight, so thank you, Efrain, for supporting us. Uh, he is the president and the CEO of the Center for Nonprofit Management. If you're not familiar with CNM, you should look them up. CNM is a powerful force in our region, supporting the nonprofit sector, doing trainings, providing, building their capacity to make sure that they're able to serve uh, communities in our neighborhoods. And so Efrain has a lot of great perspective. Uh, Miguel talked about some of the major topics and campaigns that Efrain is leading in the county to make sure folks are getting paid. So I'm going to ask a question uh, to Efrain about that. And then I want to invite Talia Sawyer, uh, who is from Upstream Pictures. She is the community uh, outreach manager uh, for the film company. She is part of the team that put this movie on, and so I'm going to ask questions of her um, about what this movie is about and what she's experienced from the Hollywood perspective, y'all, because th there is a lot of work for us to do around narrative change. So um, let's see here. We have two mics, so what we're going to do is we're going to share. That's what we do. And so um, actually, Talia, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. Uh, Talia, tell us a little bit about what is this, what are we going to see in this movie in a second? What are we going to see? Uh, I am confident that everybody is, can you hear me okay? I don't know if it's on. Maybe if I turn it on. <laughs> I'm really confident that everybody in this room already knows a lot of what they're going to see. 
Um, but I'm also very confident that you are going to be moved, that you're going to be inspired, and that you're going to be motivated. This film is an incredibly powerful tool that I hope that you all are able to wield to deepen your impact and incredible work that you're already doing in the sector. Um, it's, it's, uh, we have an opportunity here to really move the needle, and um, you're going to watch a movie, but also what you're seeing is the beginning of a movement. Now tell us, um, you know, you've seen the movie a few times, I imagine, and you've, wor <laughs> you've worked with uh, Stephen Gyllenhaal, the director, and Meredith Blake, the producer. Um, what are some of your favorite parts of the movie? What, what moved you as a person that when you first watched it? What, what is something that you learned? I come from outside of the sector. I come from uh, I come from network television, to be honest. A lot of documentaries as well, but network television. Um, I had no idea what doc, you know, what overhead really even meant. To be totally honest, I am the target idiot uh, that didn't know what nonprofits were facing. I, with my ten dollar donations, was always wondering, well, how much is going to programming? I knew nothing. Um, and to be honest with you, when this film first came across my desk, I said, oh my gosh, a film about you know charity overhead. I, I don't really, okay, you know, <laughs> see how this goes. Um, and by the end of it, I was giving my own TED Talk about a subject that I had previously known nothing about. Um, I am a firsthand example of the power of this film to really make people feel and understand a topic that is, you know, not necessarily like, Friday date night material. Um, so I'm really, really proud to have worked on this film. Really what this film taught me is the importance of understanding um, the just how powerful the nonprofit sector is and how each of us has been touched by a nonprofit organization. And you know, even those of us who are not necessarily in the sector really need to be participating in this conversation in really meaningful ways. Um, so I'm just so psyched to be here. Um, I have another question for you, Talia, but I'll come back to you in a second about the next steps after we watch this movie. But Efrain, you lead uh, the Center for Nonprofit Management. Um, I know you've been doing this work for a long time. So Efrain uh, was also in philanthropy before, but he also worked in the public sector, uh, really trying to design government systems that work for folks. Uh, so you have experience all over the map, Efrain. And so my question to you is, um, you hear from nonprofit partners all, all the time. I'm sure you get calls like the one that Miguel got, Miguel got on Sunday. What are people saying? What what are your clients telling you? What are your nonprofit partners telling you about their struggles? Well, <clears throat> thanks, Rudy, and Talia, thanks for sharing your perspective and for working in the movie, even if it didn't sound exciting at first. Uh, it's, it's definitely much needed and very timely. You know, I've been at the center now for nine months. I just started nine months. Um, but I think the partnership and investment in nonprofits has been throughout the decades, but particularly. Uh, more in CCF and I think from the what I was hearing when I was in philanthropy um, if you listen closely is uh, nonprofits who are trying to uh, talk to you about what they're trying to build in community what it takes for the humans that are really uh, driving this work uh, to really be able to one build a life for themselves and create an impact for others, while sometimes in philanthropy we're saying, that's great, so tell me about your program, right? Tell, tell me about, um, you know, have, have you innovated anything or put anything out? And so I think one is what they're telling us with the nonverbal cues is you're not asking me the right questions, right? I think as I've gotten to the center, one of the things that drew me to leave philanthropy, I always tell folks, I didn't need a job, right? I had a boss, let me do the work that I love to do. I woke up in the morning and we had $3 billion in the bank. I wake up in the morning now and, and ask how much money do we have between now and the 30th. Um, and so, but what inspired me to leave was watching the way that throughout a pandemic, hundreds of thousands of lives were saved. And what government cared the most about was, no, you can't have more than this percent in indirect. And we still want you to comply with all of these different compliance measures in doing that. So what are nonprofit partners telling us is, one, we thought we wanted government money, but this is hurting us more than it's helping us. Uh, the second thing they're telling us is, it was great that during COVID, all the funders were very helpful, and now we're afraid that we're gonna hit what they're calling the COVID cliff, which is, the grants will get smaller again, our reporting requirements gonna start coming back again, so those admin costs coming back. 
and many of them are coming and what we're realizing is you know we need to step up our advocacy while we're doing the the capacity building in ta because the reality is that you can strategic plan your way out of a capital flow issue right and so um, what they're really saying is we need to change the structure we need to change the game uh, and that's why a lot of the work that we're doing is starting to change the perception of what is the nonprofit sector uh, in our economy and our communities. What is the nonprofit sector to you? I think it's the social impact industry cluster. And, and what I tell people often is, let's just look at LA. We've got the 2028 Olympics. We've got the 20, we've got 2026 FIFA. If you've ever been part of any of the conversations about how they choose the cities, there's the corruption part, right? Payolas and all that. But in terms of doing it, uh, they're looking at are these model cities that represent our values. Do we really believe that the city of LA, which has third world income inequality, rampant homelessness, and a number of other issues like crumbling education and unfinanced education systems are models of what espouse the, the Olympics or FIFA? No. What really sells it is we've got a robust civil society. We've got strong democracies. We've got communities working and making positive change where we're working together. Uh, so what that tells me is that there's a clear value that the nonprofit sector provides, and we are yielding that, right? But nonprofits then get nothing, right? Same thing during COVID. So when you ask me what is the nonprofit sector, it's critical infrastructure and part of the safety net that's saving lives. It is the critical and pillar industry cluster that is actually going to deliver on all these promises of we're going to have a reimagined economy. We're going to have more inclusive economies. We're going to transform and we're not going to go back. I think it's the industry cluster that will be the measure of whether we did that or not. Um, so friends, we are here talking to uh, 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 film industry uh, 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 Executive, I'm going to call you an executive tonight if that's okay, uh, <laughs> and also an expert in the nonprofit sector, and also an executive in our field. If anybody has any questions, we might take a, a one or two. So feel you know, start jotting them down or thinking about them. Efrain uh, Miguel was just here, and he talked about what it, an organization that seemed like they were doing really important work, and they had a cash flow issue, so they couldn't pay their workers in the next month, and they were worried. And it sounded like they were waiting for resources from the government to pay them. So they did this work and they were waiting to get reimbursed and it seemed like it was a lot of money. I think he said $3 million. It was a tremendous amount of money. You're doing work on that, yes? Center for Nonprofit Management is doing on, do, advocating for nonprofits to get paid quicker or in a better way. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, and, and, and I'm gonna be a little bit controversial and say we're, we're going beyond that because what I tell folks is when we're offered streamlining opportunities and government will always invite you to do process improvement work but it's become such an issue where why would, why would I want to create a faster path to the same shitty outcome, right? Because that's what streamlining is. There's no structural change. So yes, we're trying to help those that are going to run out of cash and not pay folks, but the real issue with the government work that we're doing is the structural change of what is the rate of pay. In the city of LA, 626,000 people are employed in the nonprofit sector. 44% of them make below a living wage. And a lot of those have government contracts, right? That means that government contracts are not paying living wages. Uh, they're not even paying on time. So it's like, not only are you underpaying me, but you're not even paying me on time. So it is truly, and Miguel referenced the word, I believe that it is truly an exploitation that's going on. And so we are doing work on what's taking long to pay these folks, but the real fundamental work we're trying to do is we want full cost contracts that pay people what they should be getting paid so they could offer living wages and, and, and whatnot. Wow. Hey, Efrain, it sounds like you have some supporters here in the crowd. Uh, what do you, on that campaign, on that work, I know there's a lot of organizations that are helping you and are part of that work to advocate to our county supervisors to make some changes. Well, how would you want people to get involved in that? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is we're working with the Angelino Project and putting together what we call the Nonprofit Equity Action Team. The idea is let's create a Marshall Plan that makes it clear to government, and hopefully we go as far as 
in, in encouraging philanthropy as well to sort of look at what it really takes. What is the real level of capital that it takes to have a thriving social impact sector in our region? Let's make a commitment to have the uh, most thriving social impact sector in the country. And so the way to get involved is one, join the action team, reach out, communicate through the Angelino Project. The second is we are going to be working to launch a campaign that calls on the county to make two commitments. One is to officially, by way of you know, motion, declare that nonprofits for the county are essential infrastructure and that their contract should reflect sustaining that infrastructure. And two, get as close to full cost as possible. So we will be putting out communications. We will be asking folks to sign petitions, to come out and begin to make calls. Uh, to move and support the sector in this way. So more to come in January, but in the immediate, join the action team, get involved with the Angelino Project. Great, amazing, yes, round of applause for that. Is there any questions in the audience on that? And on that note, uh, joining the Angelino Project, getting involved, uh, if I, we should work together to make sure that everybody here that signed up for tonight gets a link and knows how to act, get activated. Idea, Does anybody have any questions? Everybody knows everything. Everybody wants to watch the movie. Everybody wants to watch. Okay. Oh, oh Lisa, Lisa, I had a question. I, I do. I, I'm going to quote Nikki. I see Nikki here. And how many times I've heard Nikki say, why on earth do we call it not nonprofits? Why are we calling yes. them nonprofits? Yeah. Right? All right. So, how do we change that narrative? Not just with funders and government, but with the whole mass. How do we change the narrative? Yeah. Wow. Tell you, uh, tell you, wanna, you wanna. Yeah. Got in the Man, I, I really think, uh, you know, this film has been called The Inconvenient Truth for Nonprofits. I think this film has a real shot at moving the needle in exactly that way. Um, we had Eddie, um, a man named Eddie, who's a leader at the United Way Santa Barbara, come to a screening. He says, I'm not doing any more not profit. I'm not using those words anymore. I'm calling for impact. And I thought, that is exactly right. Um, this film really is a movement. Um, we need your help getting this in front of as many people as possible to not only inspire folks like me who had no idea th about these issues, but also to inspire people working tirelessly all the time to, to make a difference in the world. Um, this film has the power to reach both. And once you see it and feel it and hear it, you cannot unsee it, unfeel it, and unhear it. So. What do we do about it? I really think this film, through storytelling, through really good storytelling, has a shot at moving that needle in a really significant way. So that is my hope for this film. That's what keeps me working on this film, is because I really, truly believe that that is the case. Hey, Frank, do you want to add anything to the narrative? Sure. I, I, would say, I would say there's one, the narrative, but then also the structure, right? So we need to look at tax status and tax codes. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, just stop using the word nonprofit and start talking to nonprofits about how they see themselves. A number of them will say we're enterprises. A number of them will say we are community assets, right? And so I think the first thing to do is to say don't call them nonprofits. Um, we have social, social enterprises, right? But we should be expanding that a little bit more. So what it is, I don't know, but we should stop thinking about it as nonprofit. I was just at the Small Business Commission, and I'll shut up. Today, this week to present on the equity and county contracting work. We're asking them to start calling on the county as well because this impacts small businesses as well. And there was a gentleman there because we proposed the idea of change your charter and include our organizations as part of your mission in the commission so we don't have to call for our own commission. And a gentleman said, why would we do that? These are uh, organizations that don't pay taxes that basically get free rides, their missions do not align with our missions. And so that is the danger of continuing to use nonprofit. Yeah. Sorry, I was taking a photo of you, Efrain. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, Friends, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up now, um, but I do want to give a, another shout out to Talia and Upstream Pictures. If anybody wants to host a screen of this film, let's assume that you like it. You're gonna watch it right now. Uh, please uh, connect with Talia, and we'll make sure that you have her contact information as well. She's trying to get the word out, and that's how we start changing the narrative around these things. Um, I want to give props to uh, my colleagues, if I can, Efrain, <laughs> uh, my colleague Nicole, our deputy director, Mark is here. Uh, 
Dallas is here uh, uh, behind the camera. And Julie and Montserrat are also in the front. You should ask them what they do, what they do and also where they come from and their expertise because it's really impressive. And so I am also very passionate about our sector. I believe that we have some of the smartest people in the world working on some really challenging topics, and we need to invest in them. And so that's why we wanted to host this film. Um, and so with that, I think what we're going to do is take a popcorn break for folks that I rushed out of the popcorn line. So um, we're going to start the film at, in five minutes. So feel free to get popcorn, and then the film will begin in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much.